Welcome again to another edition of the IDS Hour. I'm your host, Paul Honeycutt, joined as always by Jeff Wilker, Director of In-Depth Studies. Jeff, we're uh, plotting our way through here, sorting out the will of God. I trust it's His will that we're doing this. But uh, we've been talking about the moral will, uh, sovereign will we started with, then the moral will. Last week we talked about, um, we actually looked at, or talk, I think I brought up the Matthew 5 uh, verse where Jesus says he didn't come to abolish the law but to fulfill it. But then we, as part of our study last week, we went to Ephesians two fourteen to 16, which seems to say the opposite. How do well, we interpret all of that? Okay, that's, uh, this can be a little sticky area. <laughs> and since we always just avoid sticky areas. Uh, as we, much as possible. Yeah, we refuse to touch them. But no. Okay, let me first review where we've come. When we talk about sorting out the will of God, what we're saying is that any decision that a believer makes that doesn't violate Scripture is by definition in the will of God. And then we talked about the use of the wills of God in Scripture, that is the sovereign will, which is God's predestined plan for us, that includes every possible thing, and that the sovereign will determines every scenario that we encounter as believers of which we have to make a decision about in order to determine the will of God. And then we talk about the moral will, which is Scripture, which tells us, okay, as we apply Scripture to the situation that, we're in, that we have encountered, then Scripture tells us what we can or cannot do. That is, what is the will of God in that situation for us to do? So we are now focusing in on the moral will, which is Scripture, which, is, which tells us everything we need to know about finding God's will, in the sense of what is His will. You know, sometimes they call it, we call it the moral will, but we're just using the language of Friesen from his book, Decision Making and the Will of God. But you could, be, you could call it the revealed will. Okay. So, so then the issue is, okay, I, Scripture is all sufficient. We talked about that last time. But now we're back to the issue of, okay, what version of law or, or what law applies to me? Because we know there's 600 and some Mosaic laws under the Old Covenant, plus we have all the other teaching this side of Pentecost, which we would call the Law of Christ. And so we know, at least at this point in our study, that in order to determine what is the will of God in a particular situation, we apply appropriate Scripture. So now we are addressing the question, what is the appropriate scripture to apply, or another way of saying that, what is biblical law for us, this side of Pentecost, in the New Covenant era? That's really what we're at. So we talked about last time, mm-hmm. Ephesians 2, where verses really 11 through 18, where the overall context is the Apostle Paul is explaining how this side of Pentecost in the New Covenant era, God is creating a new version of the people of God, the church, made up of both Jews and Gentiles. It's going to be mostly Gentiles. And it's not a theocracy like Israel. It's it's not ethnically driven like Israel. It's not that at all. And in the midst of that discussion we saw in verse 14, it says, talking about Jesus, for he himself is our peace, and I'm reading from the NIV, for he himself is our peace who has made the two, one, that's the Jew and the Gentile, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace and in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who are far away, the Gentile, and peace to those who are near, the Jew. For through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Okay, we talked about this, that, okay, the, what will stand in the way of accomplishing this new version of the people of God, the church, which is the spiritual Israel, 
what will get in the way? Well, we, the Mosaic Law. Because it's called a wall of hostility, the Mosaic Law will not allow for a new version of the people of God. It won't do that. And so in order for there to be this new version of the people of God, that the that old version of, uh, of God's law, the Mosaic law, for Israel under the Old Covenant has to be abolished. And we have to be under a new version. Okay, now that sounds pretty straightforward. So we're just reviewing. But as soon as you say that the Mosaic law has to be abolished, what immediately seems to come to mind in everyone's thought is Matthew 5, on the Sermon on the Mount, verses 17 18, where Jesus seems to be saying just the opposite. So let's turn there. Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Now, Paul, this is how... Well, let's read it first, and then I'll tell you how I used to sort of read it privately, and maybe how you used to read it privately. For, of course, this is a Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is introducing in Matthew 5, 6, and 7. He's talking about what it's like in, in the re, if you are a believer, the real people of God, how do we live, and mm-hmm. that kind of a thing. But verse 17 says this, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear... Not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Okay? So, how do... I mean, when I, especially as a Presbyterian, you know, and I attended a Presbyterian seminary, Covenant Seminary in St. Louis, which is the PCA seminary today, uh... I used to read this like this, verse 17. Do not think that I've come to abolish the law. I've not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And so then my solution as to what this means would be that Jesus perfectly kept the Mosaic law in my place. That's what this is all about. The problem is, that's not really what it says. You know, and uh, how did you come across this when you first... I think the same, same way, because your your mind is thinking in terms of law. Mm-hmm. That's, that's sort of the primary, because in the nation of Israel, it was completely law-based. It was what you did that got you in or out. And so, yeah, I, I agree with you. It's the, same, it's the same idea. You just sort of skip over. Right. Uh, like, it's, like it's Invisible Ink or The Prophets. Yes. It just sort of doesn't, doesn't register. That he's really talking about more than just the Mosaic Law when he says this. Yeah, so when he says, I've, I have cut... Do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. As soon as you're saying that, we'll talk about this in just a moment, but I think he's moving outside the realm of Jesus obeying the Mosaic law, mm-hmm. and he's talking about something different. But let's go to verse 18, because we'll address verse 18 first. And I think once we address that first... Mm-hmm then everything else will seem kind of straightforward. Verse 18 says, Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law, it's Mosaic law, nobody disputes, disputes that, until everything is accomplished. That is, okay, he says, thou... The smallest portion of the Mosaic Law will be in full effect until everything is accomplished. And the present heavens and earth are not going to disappear until this happens. I mean, they're going to stick around. So we have no fear of the earth ending prematurely before this everything is accomplished. The problem, though, exists is in verse 18... What are they referring to when they say, until everything is accomplished? Mm -hmm. And and the two options, I'm not aware of any other option, is number one, the second coming. Because obviously, second coming, you think in terms of accomplishing. Or the cross. The cross. So let's try on 
the second coming, sort of like a suit of clothes. Just try it on, see if it fits. So then it would be saying that the smallest portion of the Mosaic Law is in full effect until the second coming. Now the question is, does the rest of the scripture bear that out? It would say, no. Mm. No. Even, I mean, just, just without even going into a lot of scripture at this point, even our brothers who embrace covenant theology and think a chunk of the Mosaic Law still applies today, even they would not say that all of the Mosaic Law applies today. Mm -hmm. So, example, if you go back to Leviticus chapter 19, just flip over there, Leviticus 19. This is, at least the NIV entitles this chapter, Various Laws. And, and of course, you have some of the what we call the big laws, uh, about, like, verse 3, each of you must respect his mother and father, and you must observe my Sabbaths. I am the Lord your God. Then verse 4, do not turn to idols or make gods of cast metal for yourselves. I am the Lord your God. Well, that's obviously, we think that's quite important. But then, if you go to verse 19, he says, keep my decrees. Do not mate different kinds of animals. That means... A, um, a mule would be sin to, to create a mule because it's created from a donkey and a horse mm -hmm. mating together. Do not plant your field with two kinds of seed. Can't have a mixed garden. Do not wear clothing woven of two kinds of material, a cotton blend, which is usually a preferable kind of fabric today. No, those would be sinful. Well, I'm not aware. I mean, I'm, I'm sure there could exist somewhere, but in the broad spectrum of e evangelicalism, I'm not aware of anybody who actually thinks these are really ap applicable for today. Now, we know, we have just, as we survey some stuff, we know that in the teaching passages of the New Covenant era, it expressly will talk in terms of some things don't apply anymore from the old, that are very crystal clear. And we, we've, uh, in Hebrews... 9, we talked about this, or Hebrews 7, excuse me, we talked in terms of, uh, you know, the priesthood of Jesus, because remember that we have this concept of, in the Old Covenant era with Israel, there was the tribe of Levi, and then within the tribe of Levi, the family of Aaron, and within the family of Aaron, the males 30 to 50 years old, these are the guys who are going to be the priests. Okay, and, and the Mosaic Law is very clear, it just spells that out. But when you get to Hebrews chapter 7, where they talk about Jesus, our Messiah, the he represents a different kind of a priesthood. Because what they're doing is they're comparing, contrasting a priesthood that's only a picture, the Levitical or the Aaronic priesthood, only a picture, can't do anything, can't take away sin, can't change a life, versus a priesthood Jesus, his priesthood is called the, after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, this priesthood actually pays for sin. So Christ's death on the cross, of course the concept of a priest. The priest represents people to God. So Jesus represents all those who are going to believe. He offers his life as a sacrifice. His life is accepted. So he purchases for those whom he represents full forgiveness of sin and a changed life for the work of the Holy Spirit. Okay, well that's pretty straightforward. But within that discussion, if you get down to verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 7, for it says, when the, For when there is a change of the priesthood, there must also be a change of the law. Because the Mosaic law will not allow for a new version of the priesthood. So, in order for this new priesthood to take place, the law must be changed. Or, to use the language of Ephesians 2, that the law must be abolished. The Mosaic law must be abolished. Now, our, bro our brothers who embrace covenant theology, who, who try to make the claim that the Mosaic law, given their Mount Sinai, is the full expression of God's law, 
And that law is said to continue unless it is fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, the problem is, is Matthew 5.18 says the smallest portion of the Mosaic law must be in a full effect. So if you can say, well, that particular law is not for today because it's fulfilled in some sense in Christ, well, that doesn't help because that mean, that still means that portion of the Mosaic law is no longer in effect. Just like the requirement for priesthood from the tribe of Levi, the family of Aaron, is no longer in effect. And that's absolutely true. Hmm. So... So we go back and we go to Matthew 5, 18, and we say, okay, everything is accomplished cannot be second coming. It just can't be. So then, but, but this is scripture, it has to be true. <coughs> so then we say, okay, let's try on the cross. So we're saying that the, that the smallest portion of the Mosaic Law, or all of the Mosaic Law, was in full effect until the second coming, until the, the cross. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because Jesus, remember his ministry, he came, he, his ministry took place during the Old Covenant era when he was under the Mosaic Law. So, so he was a Sabbath keeper, he was a tither, mm -hmm. things like that. So he kept all those Mosaic Laws right up until he went to the cross. And so that would seem to fit quite neatly. So then we are saying that the smallest portion of the Mosaic Law is in full effect until the second coming. I mean, to, excuse me, until the cross. Mm -hmm. I've got this sort of knee-jerk reaction. Coming. I think yes, I know. You're doing uh, Revelation in another yes, series. Yes, I know. And so then you drop back and you say, okay. It says, Jesus says this. I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. So when he says, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets, he's no longer talking about just obeying the Mosaic law. He's talking about that period of time, which is the law and the prophets, which is the old covenant era, from Pentecost to the cross. Mm -hmm. And he says, in effect, I come to fulfill what that was all about in picture form. That is, it's all about redeeming a people on the cross, of which in the Old Covenant period of time, in the Mosaic Law, there were pictures of this. Mm -hmm. Example, uh, the sacrificial system, you know, the Day of Atonement. They all picture, you know, that... You need your God's people need to have their sins forgiven. Okay. Well, this the sacrifice. The book of Hebrews, chapter ten, tells us that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. That's just not possible. But they were a picture. They were a picture of what Jesus was going to actually accomplish. So, and of course, what he accomplished by his work on the cross is called the new covenant. So. The Old Covenant was a time of the picture in preparation for the time of fulfillment, the New Covenant, the cross of Jesus. So then we would say that Jesus is, does not come to abolish the Law and the Prophets. He came to fulfill it, which is absolutely true. Well, and when we look at the Old, the old Covenant Law, let's just stay on Law and, and forget the Prophets just for a second, but looking at the Mosaic Law, the purpose of the Mosaic Law was to show the nation of Israel their need for mercy because they were unable because remember, you know, we talked about this in other studies when you look at, at I think it's um, Deuteronomy where it talks about if you do the if you obey my law completely or perfectly I will bless you, but if you break any of it, I will curse you mm -hmm. so there isn't, there's no wiggle room there in reality with the Mosaic law so the I think a lot of people take, as I would, just a, a human logic standpoint. Okay, so Jesus came, he fulfilled the law, meaning he obeyed it. And that's where this imputation of the active obedience comes in. Because logically, from one standpoint, that sort of makes sense. Yes. But that's not what he did, ultimately. That 
the other side of that, the punishment or wrath of God that is promised for anyone who breaks the law, and we know we are all, we come into this world lawbreakers. Mm-hmm. So then how is, so then when Jesus is saying this in Matthew, he's come to fulfill the law, and we're saying at the cross, not second coming, then is it, is it, a lot of people would say, well, sure, he kept it perfectly. That's how he fulfilled it on our behalf. That would be their argument. I don't, sure it would I don't be. Hold sure it would be. But it's actually, from another standpoint, and this is what, what it took me a while to understand, no, I was condemned by the law. He paid the price. He paid that penalty. He endured the wrath that should be mine. Mm-hmm. That's how he fulfilled yeah. the law at the cross. And that's a major distinction there. Well, it is because when, when it says... When he says, do not think I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Right. When he says, fulfill them, which is law and prophets, right. he's not narrowing your focus to obedience mm-hmm. to law. Mm-hmm. He's fulfilling the purpose of the law and the prophets, which is preparing the way for the coming of the Messiah. And then when the Messiah comes then er- er- everything gets accomplished. Are, now, the, are the prophecies, in the, you know, when we talk about, I know law and prophets is, is, is code for the whole Old Testament in a sense, the Old Covenant, but is the fulfillment of the prophets still taking place? Yes. So that's not a, it didn't all happen at the court. Well, no, because even, that's a whole other discussion, mm. but the idea that some prophecies referring to the first coming, mm. some to the second right, coming, right. We understand that, but we understand that that when it refers to the cross as accomplishing everything, mm-hmm. the second coming is sort of a a second phase of that which is already accomplished. It's kind of the already not yet. Already not yet. Right. So Jesus accomplishes everything on the cross, but historically what he accomplishes has two phases to it. Mm-hmm. Okay. okay. Now, let's look at just a couple of things. In Romans chapter 5... Verse twenty, because in this particular section, verses Romans five twelve through twenty one, mm-hmm. it's talking about the method God uses to accept us, to justify us, to cause us to become righteous, mm-hmm. and that is we get our sins forgiven. Jesus is our substitute; He pays for our sins on the cross, so we are saved by representation. So that's the, the idea. But in verse twenty, it, it just adds this statement: the law. Now, the law was added. Now the law in this context everybody would agree because it, it, it describes it in verses 12 through 14 is the Mosaic Law. So Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai which is the first formal giving of law. The law was added so that the trespass might increase. Of course the trespass is Adam's sin in this context. So we come into the world guilty of Adam's sin but he gave his law, Mosaic law, to Israel on Mount Sinai in the Old Covenant so that their sin might increase. Because we know from Romans 7, 5 that when God's law confronts an unbelieving heart, the, at least the NIV uses the phrase, our spiritual passions are aroused, our sinful passions are aroused, mm-hmm. so that we sin more, not less. So, if Israel being an unbelieving picture of the people of God. If God gives his law, a holy law to Israel, the Mosaic law on Mount Sinai, is this going to make them better or worse? And the answer is worse, not because the law is bad, but because Israel as a whole, is they are unbelieving. And so when God's law confronts an unbelieving heart, sin increases. That is what happened to Israel because it is a 1,500-year sort of, object lesson, historical object lesson showing the futility of trying to be accepted by God on the basis of what you do. Mm-hmm. And that's hopeless. So so once again, so we, we see the the old covenant era as a time of preparation, time of picture, and if you flip over to First Corinthians, there is a chapter ten. First Corinthians chapter 10, we have uh, sort of a little section where Paul is, going to, is in effect answering the question, how are we supposed to handle Israel's history? 
Because hmm. Israel is a temporary, unbelieving picture of the people of God. So what relevance does it have for us? And so Paul, in the first five verses, he recounts a number of the uh, events of that first generation of Israelites who came out of Egypt, the Exodus. And then verse 6 says, Now these things occurred as examples to keep us from sending, setting our hearts on e- evil things as they did. And so we are to look at Israel and see how they uh, complained, mm-hmm. whined, things rebelled, things like that. And because they were the p- people of God, even in picture form, we are supposed to take that to heart. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that's true. Then it recounts in verses 7 through 10 some more s- historical scenes of that first generation. But you get to verse 11. Mm-hmm. It says, These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us, believers, on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Mm -hmm. So we who are believers in the New Covenant era, we are in the time of fulfillment. And to use the language of Matthew 5, 18, everything has been accomplished. The cross, Jesus purchased everything, the guarantee that that we that there would be a second coming, we would have resurrected bodies, new heavens, new earth, that was all purchased, really, at the cross. So, going, sort of now, tying somewhat of a ribbon around this thing, if you ask the question, okay, did, is the Mosaic Law abolished? Well, it all depends what you mean. As far as, Ephesians 2 says that as far as which law are we under Mm -hmm. this side of Pentecost, the answer is we're not under that. We're under another version of law called the law of Christ. Okay, And so the Mosaic law has been abolished because it cannot do, or, uh, or maybe rephrase that, it doesn't allow for what God wants to do in the New Covenant era. Example like the new version of the people of God, the church. But from another perspective, has God abolished the law? No, not in the sense of its purpose. Mm -hmm. Because the law and the prophets, the old covenant era, of which Mosaic law is primary, its purpose was to prepare for the Messiah who would actually fulfill its purpose and purchase the salvation, purchase a real people of God who actually had their sins forgiven in a transformed life of which Israel was only a temporary, unbelieving picture. So, Ephesians 2 says we're no longer under Mosaic law. Matthew 5, 17, 18 says Jesus fulfilled the purpose of the law and the prophets. So they're answering two different questions. Mm -hmm. And we all too often, especially Matthew 5, 17, 18, confuse that one. So that's where we're at. So it's rather important. I think it's good because you can. I mean, I've I've uh, been uh, not so much guilty of, but I've seen I've seen others who have, who will take a word or a phrase, and they will find a single definition, and then and it can really distort how you how you would interpret. And it's a classic case. What does abolished mean in Ephesians versus what does abolished mean in in uh, Matthew? And how does that how you know you have to look at the context. You have to yes, look, yeah. context is key. Said, context, yeah, as you said, it's answering two entirely different questions. Yes, and if you don't know that, you're going to you're going to come up with the wrong answer. Yeah, so we'll we'll draw this to a close right now. But we will spend a little bit more time uh, just talking about the moral will yeah. and uh, so make sure we have a clear understanding of things as we uh, press on to figure out how to sort out the will of God. At the end of the show, you'll see some uh, contact information. Feel free to give us a call, send us an email, get on Skype, do whatever you want to do if you want to talk to us. I'll uh, be glad to interact with you, and it's never a problem. That's what we do. All right. We'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.